Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. Over the weekend, I saw Christopher Nolan's film, Oppenheimer. This is a national emergency. Detonator's charged. We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. We have a 12-month head start. 18. How could you possibly know that? We've got one hope. All America's industrial might and scientific innovation connected here. A secret laboratory. Keep everyone there until it's done. You are the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves. And the world is not prepared. Truman needs to know what's next. Two. What's next? One. And while it is a fantastic piece of filmmaking, and I encourage everybody to see it, and I applaud everything it does uh, to help encourage a, a rational and deeper discussion. I shouldn't even say deeper because there's practically no discussion going on about American and other nuclear weapons policy, nuclear war policy. Um, still, I think there are some serious issues that need to be discussed about the film. And now joining me to do that is someone who's been studying the issues of nuclear war, nuclear weapons, and American-Japanese relations, and World War II for decades. So now joining me is Peter Kuznick. He's professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University. Peter is the co-author with Oliver Stone, of the Showtime series, The Untold History of the United States. And as I said, Peter has been studying nuclear weapons for a long time. His latest book is The Untold Post-War History of the United States and Japan, co-authored again with Oliver Stone and former Japanese Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama. And I hope I pronounced that close. Thanks for joining me, Peter. Glad to be with you, Paul. The film is based on the book American Prometheus, and it's written by Kai Bird and Marty Sherwin. Peter knew Marty, who passed away not too long ago, and is a friend of Kai Bird. And I should also say I'm making a film now uh, based on Daniel Ellsberg's book, Doomsday Machine, Confessions of a Nuclear War Planner. Our film is called How to Stop a Nuclear War. And, uh, and both Peter and I knew Dan quite well. Of course, Dan, Peter knew Dan for years. So, Peter, what's, what's your impression of the film? It's a very complex film. It's a three-hour biopic that really offers more information about nuclear history and American politics from the 1940s, actually even before that, 1930s, 1920s, than almost any other movie I can think of. So it's a very dense film. A lot of attention is paid to certain things. One is the Trinity test. On July 16, 1945, when Oppenheimer and the scientists of Los Alamos did the atomic bomb test of the plutonium bomb in Alamogordo, New Mexico. There's a lot about the buildup to that. This is a matter of life and death. But I can perform this miracle. World War II would be over. Our boys would come home. That's happening, isn't it? The world will remember this day. Our work here will ensure a peace mankind has never seen. Until somebody builds a bigger one. 
And so that's developed very thoroughly. And then there's a lot afterwards about the 1954 Army security hearings in which Oppenheimer loses his security clearance. Is a little bit later about the 1959 hearings in which Louis Strauss, who is Oppenheimer's main antagonist in this film, he's up to be Secretary of Commerce, and he gets rejected by the Senate because largely the scientists' opposition to him because of his role in trying to destroy Oppenheimer during the 1954 hearings. Strauss, spelled Strauss, but pronounced Strauss, was the former head of the Atomic Energy Commission. He's the one who has the real vendetta against Oppenheimer, as we learn in the movie. So that is all done very, very well. There are other things that are left out or elided, and that is unfortunate, or else they're done very briefly, and one has to be super quick and know all the history and know all the people to even make sense out of them. The biggest shortcoming is its failure to accurately assess what scientists knew and what others knew before the United States dropped the atomic bombs on Japan. There was quite a bit of controversy, and that does not come across. Nolan, to his credit, raises it, the scientists' opposition to dropping the bomb three times that, is, that I've picked up on, but they are very short, very cryptic, very brief, and if you're not on top of it, you'll miss it. And the final word is always given to Oppenheimer or military people who say that if we don't drop the bomb, we're going to have to invade, and America's going to lose, what, a half million boys in an invasion. That was the myth. That is the fundamental myth of the atomic bombing that you and I have discussed. The idea that the only way to avoid an American invasion of Japan and fighting against these fanatical Japanese who are preparing to resist and would have cost a half million to a million to several million American and Japanese lives, that the only way to do that was to drop the bomb. When we know in reality there were two other major factors that could have ended the war. One was letting the Japanese know that they could keep the emperor, dropping the demand for unconditional surrender. And almost everybody who was an advisor to Truman made that point. We look at Secretary of War Stimson, Admiral Leahy, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, John McCloy, that you could go to almost everybody, the only one really who convinced Truman not to change the surrender terms was Jimmy Burns. Jimmy Burns is an anti-Soviet hawk during this period. He gets he comes up, so Truman becomes president on April 12th. Roosevelt dies on April 12th. Jimmy Burns flies up in James Forrestal's private jet the next day on April 13th. Truman had been vice president for 82 days. During that time, nobody had enough regard for him, respect for him, to even tell him that the United States was building an atomic bomb. Unbelievable. One of those things in history that's simply mind-blowing. So Truman doesn't know the United States is building an atomic bomb, despite being vice president for three months, until after he's sworn in that night. And Stimson mentions it to him. And Truman said, well, I was distracted. I didn't ask him anything. But the next day, Burns flies up. And Burns briefs him more fully on it. And Truman writes his memoir, Burns called it a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. He says it may allow us to dictate our terms at the end of the end of the war. So, uh, you know, not a bigger weapon, not a more powerful weapon, a weapon great enough to destroy the whole world. From the beginning, Truman gets that. He doesn't get a lot of things, but he understands that. And this is not in, in the movie. Uh, but also... The scientist's opposition is not in the movie. There's a little bit. There's snippets. Leo Zillard is in it. There was recently an MSNBC documentary uh, about, the, about Oppenheimer. And 
I think it's called To End All Wars. And that just came out a week or two ago. And that is so much worse than the Nolan film. So much more misinformation. In that, they mention the emigre scientists who had escaped from Nazi-occupied Europe. And they list Beta, Teller, uh, Fermi, and Einstein. They don't even mention Leo Szilard. Szilard is crucial. Brilliant Hungarian physicist. Now, we know that the Trinity test takes place on July 16th, 1945. Six years before that, to the day, July 16th, 1939, Leo Szilard and another Hungarian physicist emigre, Eugene Wigner, got up, borrowed a car, and drove out to Bacanic, Long Island, where Albert Einstein was vacationing. Einstein is by far the most famous scientist in the world. They go to see Einstein because they could not get the American authorities interested in the fact that the Germans had split the uranium atom, which meant the theoretical possibility of developing atomic bombs. And the Americans weren't interested. The American scientists were minimally interested. The American military thought, well, a new weapon won't be ready for two wars. And so they couldn't get them interested. So Zillard and Wigner go out to see Einstein, and they brief Einstein. Einstein had been so out of the loop working on his unified field theory that he didn't even know the Germans had split the uranium atom back in late 1938. But he gets it immediately, of course, and he signs the letter to President Roosevelt urging the U.S. to begin the nuclear research program. Einstein later says, I made one great mistake in my life. I have one great regret, writing the letter to President Roosevelt. But there was some justification at that time. The the emigres believed that the Germans were a year to two years ahead of us. And that's what motivated their frenzy in beginning the project. But the project got off the ground very slowly. And Einstein actually wrote three letters to Roosevelt, although the other two are not really well known. Uh, but the project doesn't get off the ground till 42. We don't test the feasibility of a nuclear chain reaction in an atomic pile until Fermi and Zillard do it at the University of Chicago in late 42. And then in 43, so that, then uh, 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 Leslie Groves is put in charge of the building the Manhattan Project and the bomb research project, which really starts in 42. Uh, and it's initially under Met Lab at the University of Chicago under Arthur, Arthur Holly Compton, a Nobel Prize winning physicist who had been a scientific activist, a left wing activist, along with Oppenheimer in the 1930s. So Compton heads Met Lab, and in the summer of 42, he asked Oppenheimer to organize a group of luminaries, to go out to Berkeley, the leading physicists, the leading thinkers, go out to Berkeley and think about the implications of this bomb if we develop it. And, Ber- and Oppenheimer advised Beta and Teller and Serger and some of the other brilliant physicists at the time. And on the train ride out there, Fermi, Enrico Fermi, had already spoken with Teller about the fusion bomb, which Teller couldn't get out of his mind. And on the train ride from the East Coast to the West Coast, he and Beta kept talking about this. Then when they get out there, they're doing calculations. And all of a sudden, all the scientists are staring at the blackboard in terror because they realize they put up equations that if they ignite an atomic bomb, it could potentially ignite all the nitrogen in the atmosphere or all the hydrogen in the seas and blow up the world. Now, this is sort of in the movie, which is to to Nolan's credit. We had a moment where it looked like the chain reaction from an atomic device might never stop. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world. Chances are near zero. Near zero. What do you want from theory alone? Zero would be nice. What happens in the movie is that 
uh, that Oppenheimer then goes and talks to Einstein about it. And Einstein acknowledges that there is the possibility of blowing up the world. Then they go back there. The reality was Oppenheimer went out to Michigan where Arthur Holly Compton was vacationing. And he laid out to Compton what they discovered. And Compton says, very importantly, better to live in slavery to the Nazis than bring down the final curtain on mankind. That's, of course, how somebody should react to that. And so they stopped the project. Oppenheimer goes back there. Beta was the best mathematician, and he realized they didn't account for all the heat that, and energy that would be absorbed by the radiation. They redo the calculations, and they decide that the chance of blowing up the world are three in a million. And they decide, well, that's enough of a risk, and that's worth it in order to stop the Nazis. But the thing about the bomb was it was never initially intended as an offensive weapon to be used in the war. It was meant entirely as... Peter, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Let me jump in, because there's, a, there's a, I think, a key thing you got to add here. When they finally decide it's, quote, near zero, that is atmospheric ignition. Yes. And, and also, just to add a little color to this, uh, Hitler's, uh, what was Spears to Hitler's, and Spears' memoir says Hitler didn't want, one of the reasons Hitler decided not to continue the program is he was afraid of atmospheric ignition. I don't know if it's true or not, but that's what Spears said. But whatever Hitler did, even if it was chance was near zero, it wasn't zero. But the thing is, they they tested after they knew that there was no longer a Nazi bomb. Uh, I've seen reports that as early as 1943, British intelligence told the Americans the German plan's going nowhere. They're relying on heavy water. It's not going to work in 44. But the actual test that takes place is actually after the defeat of Hitler. I mean, they know there's no more German bomb. So even if the risk of atmospheric ignition is near zero, why risk it? And then we'll get into the Japanese question. But it's insane that they take the risk when there's no German bomb. And Nolan's film doesn't draw that connection. No, no, no. Nolan doesn't draw that connection. Uh, Nolan is worried about this, though. I mean, he does really emphasize that. Well, I, can I just add one thing? I think he takes, he, you know, he, I think Nolan starts to think he's Oppenheimer. Like, he has to represent Yes. The world is viewed by Oppenheimer, and Oppenheimer wanted to test, and he wanted to drop the bombs on Japan. So he kind of wants to be true to Oppenheimer, but he could have been a little more true to, his, to history. Yeah. You know, so that's the problem. Oppenheimer is the protagonist. He's the focus, and he's the fascinating person. Nolan, in his commentary afterwards, said Oppenheimer was the most important man who ever lived. And he changed the course of history in a way that nobody else could. I would like to ask him if he thinks General Groves was the second most important man who ever lived. Yeah. <laughs> and what he would say to that. You know, but um Well, but, how about quoting Truman say, I'm the one that actually said use it, make me the most important man. <laughs> that's that is in the film. That's that is in the film. And a very, very important scene when Oppenheimer goes to see him afterwards. What, what, what they don't have in the movie is Henry Wallace. They don't have... I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. And all the fact that they say that, that Truman became president on April 12th. I don't know if it's April 12th, but since Truman became president, they don't mention the fact that Wallace had been vice president before Truman. That Wallace was perhaps the leading critic of using the bomb and then of the nuclear arms race that Wallace was enormously popular, unlike Truman. That July 20th, 1944, the day that the Democratic Party convention began, Gallup released a poll asking potential voters who they wanted on the ticket as vice president. 65% said they wanted Wallace back as vice president. 2% said they wanted Truman. Had Wallace been back as vice president, there would have been no atomic bombing in World War II and probably no Cold War. So history could have really been different and then no yeah, because Wallace Wallace wanted the detente the alliance to continue after the war he 
I mean, Wallace had access to all the same intelligence. He knew that yeah. the Soviet Union, whatever you want to make of the Soviet Union domestically, Wallace and many others in the know knew there was no attempt at global military domination. That, that was a total crock. No, that was the farthest thing from the mind of Stalin at that point. They wanted to work with the United States. They wanted the $20 billion in credits that Roosevelt had floated. They wanted to rebuild their society. They lost 27 million people in the war. They were desperate to rebuild. Stalin wanted- Well, that, well that's another thing about the film, which is, while I, it's good, you see the way that McCarthyite tactics were used to bring down yes. Oppenheimer in that security hearing, it still buys into the anti-communist kind of mythology. Like when Oppenheimer's wife testifies, it's all how smart she is at rebutting the, uh, the essential, essentially the prosecutor. But it's all about how they had turned their backs on communism and so on. And maybe that's true. But it never in the film ever explains why did so many smart, intelligent people, physicists and in, intelligentsia, why did they believe in the ideals of socialism? It's, it's barely a mention, maybe a hint of it about Spain, and that's it. In order to understand that, you have to read my first book, Beyond the Laboratory, Scientists as Political Activists in 1930s America. And they start off on the right wing of the political spectrum with a lot of ties to industry and technology. By the end of the decade, they're the most radical group in American society. In the election for the AAAS, which is the big side of the organization, the American Association of Advancement of Science, in December of 1938, all five leading vote-getters are on the left. The person they elect as president is the Harvard physiologist Walter Cannon, who not only was a friend of the Soviet Union, he was a socialist, and he was a leader of the anti-fascist movement. The scientists were in the forefront of the anti-fascist movement, which is why they were so eager to join the Manhattan Project. And Oppenheimer was in the heart of that. You know, they, they mentioned that, that Oppenheimer's brother was a communist and that his ex-wife, that his wife, Kitty, used to was a communist, that her ex-husband, Joseph Dallet, was killed in Spain, a communist organizer there. They don't mention really or emphasize sufficiently his homely you was communist. And all of his grad students were members of the Communist Party, several of whom he outs later, names names during that period. It doesn't come out in the movie either. That yeah. his, um, I mean, he was, he gave one tenth of his salary to the Communist Party to support the effort in Spain. He read all of Marx and Lenin. And he said, I was a member of every Communist Party front group on the West Coast. He, he might not have carried a Communist Party card, but he believed in the ideals. And so did many people in the United States in the 30s because capitalism had failed. This was the time of the Great Depression. And if you go back to Business Week and Time and, and the, so many of the publications, Christian Science Monitor, in the early 30s, they kept saying over and over again that the only country that had not been affected by the Depression was the Soviet Union. And when AMTORG, the British uh, the Soviet Trade Organization, uh, the rumors spread that they were going to hire thousands of Americans to go to work inside the Soviet Union because there was a labor shortage in the early 30s. Tens of thousands of Americans lined up outside the AMTORG offices, according to the New York Times. So the Soviet Union, before we knew about Stalin's crimes and the purges and the horrors, the Soviet Union seemed to offer an alternative utopian vision, anti-racist, anti-fascist, pro-science and technology, progressive, anti-capitalist, and of course the scientists and creative people were attracted to that. They later find out that their allies are being purged. You know, there are a lot of terrible things going on. But Oppenheimer starts to question a little bit during the time of the Nazi-Soviet pact, but it's not really until he's, he's in a position where he can take over the, the science to, at Los Alamos that he agrees with Lawrence and cuts off his ties with the former communist, except for his former fiance Jean Tatlock. And they have that scene in the film, and he goes to visit her, and they follow him. 
they're always doing surveillance on him. And she was a very active uh, communist activist. Her father was a professor at Berkeley. She was going to medical school. And she ends up committing suicide. They don't really get into that. Some people think she Although might. there is some suspicion about that, whether it really was suicide, right? There's some the debate case, about that. It's been because Boris Posh, who was the intelligence officer in charge, wanted to take Oppenheimer's graduate students who are communists out to sea and have them killed. And that is true. Uh, but it, it was rejected by some of the other cooler heads. But then you've got the, the tension between the scientists and the military. Now, Leslie Groves is played by is played by Matt Damon. I tried to familiarize myself with Groves and the history, and then talk to Chris about what he needed from that part. Groves was almost like a kindergarten teacher in some respects because these scientists were so eccentric and not necessarily trustworthy. I mean, if you're looking from a military perspective. Why would we go to the middle of nowhere for who knows how long? Why? How about because this is the most important thing that ever happened in the history of the world? Matt Damon is a great actor with very progressive views. He grew up, you know, his, his mother was good friends with Howard Zinn. And if you watch the movie Goodwill Hunting, he's got that wonderful part there about Howard's Zinn books. You know, rather than that whole shelf of books, you should just read Howard Zinn's People's History. And Matt believes that, I think. And so they, I was worried that they were going to cast him as Leslie Groves. In most accounts of the Manhattan Project and the bombing, Leslie Groves is the enemy. In this movie, given the focus, as you say, about McCarthyism, Leslie Groves gets off easy, and Louis Straws and Borden are the antagonists, the bad guys. And so Matt Damon gets to play the warmest and fuzziest Leslie Groves I've ever seen. And, they, and there's another, just let me add another piece about Groves. Uh, when the Americans do find out almost conclusively, conclusively enough, I mean, this is before the fall of Hitler, that the, there's no German nuclear weapons program, Gross doesn't tell the scientists for quite some time because he's afraid they're not going to keep working on the bomb because most of them joined in on it because it was hit. They were fighting Hitler. If it hadn't been for Hitler, they would have unlikely they would have created such a weapon. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, although they become some of them get so involved, engaged in the scientific experimentation. And they do it anyway. Oppenheimer, who's portrayed in the movie as being so adamantly opposed to the development of hydrogen bombs, when he finds out that the hydrogen bomb is feasible, he says this is a technically sweet problem and we can't abandon the research. So Oppenheimer is not quite the hero that he's portrayed at times. Well, this, go this goes back to your point about Zillard, because if Zillard had been more prominently in the film, yeah, it would have made Oppenheimer more the bad guy. He would have wound up the bad guy because Zillard, although he was an advocate of using the bomb, you know, when they first thought there was a German plan, before it's dropped on Japan, Zillard and uh, four or five other scientists have this statement. I think it's called the Frank Statement, is it? Yeah. Where they call on, absolutely don't use it against Japan, maybe use it on some uninhabited island just to show you got it. But more importantly start getting ready for negotiations to limit this because it's only a matter of time to other countries have it. It was a real cautionary statement and Oppenheimer just, you know, paid lip service to it. But, and it never, if I understand it correctly, it never even made it to the Secretary of Defense. Well, the Met Lab at Chicago had really completed its work earlier and the folks in Los Alamos Los Alamos turns into an engineering problem as they're trying to figure out how implosion is going to work for the plutonium bomb. They knew that the gun method was going to work for the atomic bomb. So they said, we don't need to test it. What they tested at Alamogordo was the plutonium bomb. And so at Chicago, at Met Lab, they set up a series of committees to investigate different aspects and the one dealing with the social and political implications of the bomb was headed by the chemist James Frank. And James Frank was very troubled by what they were finding. And he asked who he could see in the government. 
and he chose to go visit Secretary of Commerce Henry Wallace. And But Wallace was really out of the loop at that point. He stayed on after he was dropped as vice president because Roosevelt begged him to. And he was the conscience, and he was the one who was closest to the scientists, but he could not really get to Truman about the bomb decision. Uh, so Frank has this committee, and includes uh, uh, Seaborg, uh, I mean, includes Rabinovich and Slarn, top, 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 really brilliant scientists. And they decide that even if the bomb is ready and usable, we shouldn't use it. It says it's going to lead to an uncontrollable arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union that could lead to World War III and the end of life on the planet. They knew that. Everybody knew the implications. Oppenheimer, see, they in the movie, they touch on things. So Nolan covers himself without developing. So he can spend 40 minutes developing the Trinity test and the background to that and the experiments and the science. But he spends 40 seconds talking about the opposition to dropping the bomb. And if you know... Which, which, include, which included Eisenhower, right? Well, Eisenhower was opposed, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Uh, not only was Eisenhower opposed, seven of America's eight five-star admirals and generals in 1945 were opposed, either saying it was militarily unnecessary, morally reprehensible, or both. And that included not only Eisenhower, MacArthur, who wanted to use atomic bombs in the Korean War, um, and MacArthur, who was such a hawk, said that if we had changed the surrender terms, the Japanese would have happily surrendered in May, months earlier. We could have saved more lives. Admiral Leahy, who was Truman's personal chief of staff, and he chaired the meetings of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Leahy said that uh, th this puts us on the level of the barbarians of the Dark Ages. He said there was no justification for dropping the bombs on a thoroughly defeated Japan. Uh, he later says there was no excuse from a national defense point of view, no reason for an invasion. We weren't going to invade. They knew that. There was no justification for an invasion. And, and this, is, this is where we started early in the interview, because I think this is so critical, at least from the time they know there's no German bomb, if not even before. This becomes a weapon they know is going to be the way to assert American power globally. Yeah. It's really a weapon to assert hegemony around the world. It's not a, myth, a question of either ending the war in Japan or a, a weapon of defense. I mean, it's, uh, as, as troubling as that is, uh, you're a Canadian, I'm an American. You know, this, I'm a dual citizen. So I, <laughs> but, the kid, but, but so was the bomb. The bomb had the Canadian parents. So. Canadians were involved in the bomb, as were the Brits. Um, and, you know, it's a terrible legacy. Because, as you're saying, the bomb was not dropped on Japan alone. It was dropped in large part to send a message to the Soviet Union of what would happen to the Soviets if they interfered with America's post-war plans in Europe or the Pacific. Uh, 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 you know, and the point you're making, we knew the bomb was not necessary. If you look at the... Um, the meetings of the Joint Intelligence Committee to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, I should read you just what they said. The April 11th report uh, says, if at any time the USSR should enter the war, all Japanese will realize that absolute defeat is inevitable. So the two ways are changing the surrender terms or waiting for the Soviet invasion. From the day after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt had implored the Soviets to come into the Pacific War. But Stalin couldn't because he had his own war. As you know, most people don't know that throughout most of the war, the U.S. and the British confronted 10 German divisions between us, while the Soviets were confronting more than 200 German divisions throughout most of the war. The United States doesn't get seriously involved militarily until after the June 6th invasion at Normandy. And then we get more, much more militarily involved. But throughout most of the war, we weren't. And so Stalin does not, until Yalta, in February 45, he then tells Roosevelt, 
that the Soviets will come into the Pacific War three months after the end of the war in Europe. The war in Europe ends May 8th. The Soviets will be in August 8th. The Intelligence Committee said that will end the war. The Americans knew that. We've been intercepting the Japanese cables. We've broken their codes. We're intercepting the cables. And they said two things. One, July 12th cable, the only obstacle for peace is the continued demand for unconditional surrender. If they drop the demand for unconditional surrender, we could have peace immediately. Number one, Truman knows that. He reads the Tate cable on July 18th and refers to the intercepted cable as the telegram from the Jap emperor asking for peace. Truman knows they're defeated, and we all knew that. All of his advisors knew that. The second thing is, Truman goes to Potsdam on July 16th. He, 15th, and he gets has lunch with Stalin on July 17th. He then writes in his journal, Stalin will be in the Jap War by August 15th. Then he Japs when that occurs. He knew that was going to end it. It was going to be faster than July, uh, than August 15th. He writes home to his wife, Bess, the next day. The Russians are coming in. We'll end the war a year sooner now. Think of all the kids who won't be killed. He knew that. They all knew the Japanese were defeated. The Japanese themselves knew that. It was early February of 45, that the former prime minister, Prince Kanoe, wrote to the emperor and said, I regret to inform you, but defeat is inevitable. He said, the only, what we have to worry about is preventing a communist revolution when we, when we surrender. They knew that. The Supreme War Council says that. The Supreme War Council says that what we have to worry about in May is the Soviet entry. That's what we've been dreading. And so at midnight on August 8th, the Soviet Union on schedule uh, announces, begins the invasion. And if you look at what forced the Japanese surrender, it was not the atomic bombs. That is the myth. That is the lie that we've been combating, you are know, trying to combat. The lie that the atomic bombs ended the war. So, uh, and, and you, it gets repeated all the time. The New York Times just said it a couple days ago. The New York Times, what's his name? The, the, uh, their reporter who covers physics and astronomy wrote, atomic bombs ended World War II. I've got it here. I can find it, the exact quote for you. Uh, but we know that Susan Rice, former National Security Advisor, had an op-ed in the New York Times in 2019. Quote, following D-Day, my father was sent to the West Coast to prepare for the deployment to the Pacific Theater. He was spared combat by President Harry Truman's decision to drop atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, provoking the Japanese surrender. Bullshit. It's one of the founding, it's, one, it's, it's an essential mythology to defend the American myth, the American narrative, uh, because if you actually admit the truth of it, then you're saying that American administration that ended the war are essentially war criminals and, and, and ushered us into an era that could end life on Earth. It undermines the whole myth of American benevolence, American exceptionalism, this idea that the United States is different from other countries, that we want to spread freedom and democracy, that we're benevolent and generous. Well, you start this whole era by dropping atomic bomb against, two bombs against a defeated country uh, Obama, you know, I was in Hiroshima when Obama finally went there in May of 2016, and he goes in front of the Senate and he says, the, United, the World War II reached its brutal end in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Bullshit. He knows better. Susan Rice knows better. She studied at Stanford. She was a Harry Truman Fellow at Stanford. Who was the, 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 the leading person in the a uh, history department at the time, she was a history major. Bart Bernstein was teaching there. Bart and I disagree about this, about certain aspects of this, but he's a historian of nuclear history. He knows that the bombs didn't end the war and were necessary. All right, let me pick up on another theme here. The other thing which, which he could have done, uh, he being Nolan, because he makes Straws uh, such an important character in the film, and this just to remote, for people that haven't seen the film, you're going I do encourage you to go see it. Uh, but he he becomes like the main opponent of old Oppenheimer, uh, 
but but he didn't tell the story of the rise of the military industrial complex and you can do it through straws because if you know who Strauss was before he's in government, he's a big banker. He's a, he was making it in those days. His salary was over a million dollars a year. He was he was fronting or helping as a lawyer uh, the biggest corporations in the country. And this guy goes in and starts helping run military policy, logistics, and then he gets into the nuclear stuff. Yeah. I mean, he is he is one of the guys that helps construct the military industrial complex that eventually Eisenhower warns against. Nolan could have picked up on this. It didn't have to be the biggest theme. I know Oppenheimer didn't, you know, wasn't a preoccupation of his. He was, in fact, I come away, you know, much less a fan of Oppenheimer once I look in more of this because he seems so concerned to prove his loyalty. But loyalty to what? That Oppenheimer... But it was, they showed the tension between Oppenheimer and Einstein a little bit. Not quite as much as they should have. Because Einstein told Oppenheimer, don't defend yourself against these people. Look what you've done for this country, you know, and now they're trying to destroy you. He said, walk away. You've done your part. Turn your back on this hearing. It's really, it's a, a kangaroo court. You have yeah, no and, and let's let's and, and can I just jump in a bit because because it's it the the film makes it so much personal about Straws, but wasn't it more Oppenheimer by then was now opposing the uh, de the development of the hydrogen bomb. He was opposing. He wanted to have uh, the internationalization of nuclear energy so that there were real direct conversations and negotiations between the Soviet Union and the United States. Like, he wanted a more rational policy. Isn't that why they went after him? In part. It's also a little more complicated than they make out. First of all, Einstein, when Oppenheimer walked away, turned to somebody and said, there goes a nar. There goes a fool. The Yiddish term for a fool. Uh, and now Oppenheimer's record on that is really one of ambivalence. You know, he knew, he later says, the Japanese were essentially defeated. He later says it might have been a tragic mistake. Uh, he later says the physicists have known sin. When he went to see Henry Wallace, Wallace says he's on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He's afraid that Burns and these people, that the American policymakers are going to use the bomb uh, for, for diplomacy, and it's going to lead to World War III. So Oppenheimer was very troubled and conflicted but when in, in opposing the hydrogen bomb, which he called the weapon of genocide, he said, we don't need it. We can develop so many atomic bombs that we can do anything we want to the Soviet Union. We can defeat them militarily with atomic bombs. He says, I don't want to divert resources and manpower from the atomic bombs that we're building. And we don't need to. But Oppenheimer was more conflicted. The movie makes the point that all eight scientists on the Scientific Advisory Committee to the Atomic Energy Commission oppose the development of the hydrogen bomb. What it doesn't say is that Oppenheimer was probably the last one to come on board, mm -hmm. that it took the others, Fermi and the others, had to convince him to oppose the development of the hydrogen bomb. He was the most ambivalent of all of them. Uh, and then two of them, I think it was Fermi and Robbie, issue a minority report, even going further than the eight people. So the eight members of the Scientific Advisory Committee say it's a weapon of genocide. We shouldn't do it. Uh, Oppenheimer signed that. Oppenheimer wrote the report. Uh, so you, we have to give him credit. So the point you're making is correct. He did oppose the development of the hydrogen bomb. And Straws and Teller and Lawrence and the other Cold War hawks hated him for that. Now, when we're talking about the development of the military industrial complex, we could really have done that very, very easily during, during the, the film because Roosevelt then brought in all these dollar a year men from Wall Street. And they were the ones who were the anti Soviet hawks. It was people like Forrestal.
and Burns who are really doing that. Then they bring in Bernard Baruch. Oppenheimer comes up with a plan before the United Nations in 1946 for international control of atomic energy and nuclear atomic weapons. And uh, even Dean Acheson, the cold, you know, the cold warrior, thought it was a brilliant plan. And he and Lilienthal, the later the head of the Atomic Energy Commission, said that brought this to the United Nations. However, Burns and Truman chose Bernard Baruch to present it. And Baruch was a South Carolina financier, uh, much like Straws, with a financial background, hated the Soviets, and used it in a way to defeat the Soviets rather than to actually try to get international control. Oppenheimer was devastated, as they, they all were at the time, and that ended the possibility at that point for international control. So Oppenheimer was outspoken, and he was a critic of the hydrogen bomb, but he wasn't nearly as outspoken as people like Einstein or Zillard or the ones who were really heroic. Oppenheimer played it much closer to the chest in that way, uh, and Oppenheimer was always very cautious about his security clearance and his influence. He never wanted to sacrifice his influence. And yeah, that's really that, important because there's this key. What, what when Einstein says he's a fool as he walks away, um, Oppenheimer didn't have to fight losing the security clearance. He could have just remained one of the most influential scientists in the world. Yeah. Who would have known he lost his security clearance? He, he but he, he out, but he stopped speaking out afterwards. He's no longer between fifty-four and sixty-two, really, or sixty-seven when he dies. He's not a major voice. I think people uh, people have to understand the, the the pressure McCarthyism and the House of Un-American Activities Committee put on people. I mean, it, it was a form of a kind of a fascism. The the people, thousands and thousands of people, lost their jobs, their careers. It wasn't just Hollywood. There was purges in the unions and amongst teachers and government. It was a real. Uh, there was also the terror. lavender. It was a campaign of terror against progressive people. Yeah. And and it looks like Oppenheimer, well, Oppenheimer think, succumbed. And, and it's great that Nolan makes a big issue of it because the American people need to be reminded over and over again because a form of McCarthyism is taking place now. And those right. of us who are critical about America's role in, in war making now and think that we need to start talking about diplomatic off-ramps to this war in Ukraine, we get branded as Putin apologists, as somehow anti-Ukraine, uh, and it's just the opposite. And so we, we're we're dealing with that now. You you can't if you turn on American television, you will find general and admiral and defense expert and military analyst one after another defending U.S. policy and calling for sending F-16s and a, attack and missiles to Ukraine and supporting every military move that the U.S. and Ukraine have been making. But if somebody who wants to say anything critical or even suggest that there might be alternatives, that the Pope, that the, uh, that the, uh, the Guterres at the U.N., that the Chinese, that Lula in Brazil, that the Africans, that the Global South are calling for an alternative road to, to ending this crisis, ending this war, you can't get a word in. We don't get invited onto CNN or MSNBC or Fox, really, or you know. So that so it's great that Nolan talks about McCarthyism, but it's an easy target. Even Republicans denounce McCarthyism. What would have been the hard target is looking seriously at why the United States not only did not need to drop the bomb in '45, but why so many people spoke out against it and the role that Oppenheimer played in squelching that, in stopping the Zillard petition, in stopping the circulation of the Frank Committee report, in a, telling people not to sign Zillard's petition. 155 project scientists signed that, and they were opposed to the use of the atomic bomb. People knew this. Truman knew this. His advisors knew this. 
since then, the Secretary of War was always racked with guilt about this. And so later, Oppenheimer voices some guilt, but he should be because he played an instrumental role in making sure that the bombs would be dropped. And the U.S. wanted to drop those bombs for the reason that you and I had talked about before. And the interesting thing, how did the Soviets respond? I should go into this in a little bit of detail because people don't know this. But in May, the Japanese War Council had decided that their best chance of getting better surrender terms from the Allies was to get the Soviet Union to intervene on their behalf. So in early June, former Prime Minister Hirota in Tokyo goes to meet with Malik, the Soviet ambassador, and meets with him a couple of times. Malik writes back to the Kremlin in June, the Japanese are desperate to surrender. The Soviets knew this better than anybody else in the world at that time, how desperate the Japanese were to surrender. So at Potsdam, Truman makes some vague reference to the U.S. having this super weapon, and Stalin says, I hope you make good use of it. And Truman says, well, I don't think he understood what I was saying. Stalin understood what he was saying because they had the spies. They had Klaus Fuchs and Ted Hall. They knew the test was coming. Now he knew it had succeeded. And, and so when the bomb was dropped, uh, Marshal Zhukov, who was the, the top general uh, in the Soviet army, later reflected, he said, it was clear already then that the U.S. government intended to use the atomic weapon for the purpose of achieving its imperialist goals from a position of strength in the Cold War. This was amply corroborated on August 6th and 8th. Without any military need whatsoever, the Americans dropped two atomic bombs on the peaceful and densely populated Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's Marshal Zhukov. Gromyko, Foreign Minister Gromyko's son, Anatoly, recalled his father telling him that Hiroshima, quote, set the heads of the Soviet military spinning. The mood in the Kremlin and the general staff was neurotic. The mistrust toward the Allies grew quickly. Opinions floated around to preserve a large land army to establish controls over extended territories to lessen political losses from atomic bombings. Uh, all of the political leaders, including Stalin, Molotov, and others, were always were totally alarmed by this. The physicist Yuli Karatan recalled, quote, the whole Soviet government interpreted Hiroshima as atomic blackmail against the USSR, as a threat to unleash a new, even more terrible and devastating war. I mean, it, it was clear. That's how the Soviets interpreted it, and that's how it was meant to be interpreted. And, it, you know, the Cold War could have been avoided had Roosevelt lived longer. It would have been avoided had Wallace well, become... Well, maybe, but let, let, me, let me say this. We need to do a part two. Uh, we'll record it another day. But I think there's another piece to this. Eisenhower admitted what this was really about when he was president. He said, we could live with the Soviet Union. We, we can't live with other countries becoming part of the socialist system and maintain our form of, of capitalism. So Eisenhower, there's a very clear-cut quote from Eisenhower that the real issue isn't whether Soviet Union is a threat. He knew it wasn't. But the expansion, because the national liberation movements were all gravitating towards some form of socialism or another. And if that was going to take them out of the Western sphere of capitalism, that was the big threat. But there's another big threat. And I think this is what I want to talk to you more about. And, and your series, Untold History, gets into this fantastically. The other target of McCarthyism had nothing to do with Soviet expansion or Soviet threat. It had to do with the threat of the New Deal. They wanted, they, the people that replaced Wallace with Truman, and afterwards, afterwards, right up through Clinton, and you name it, of course, Reagan, they wanted to undo the New Deal because it wasn't necessary anymore. Maybe there was, maybe you could justify it. They didn't even like it in the 30s, and some of them even wanted to have a coup against Roosevelt. But ever since the end of World War II, 
the anti-communist Cold War, McCarthyite purges and terror was against American progressives that, who had nothing to do with working for the Soviet Union. They just wanted to squash the New Deal. So, so not now, but I want to do a part two because I think this is the piece of the Cold War that almost never gets talked about. And it, so, but, but a last word on the film. Last word on the film, it's a brilliant film. It's a positive achievement. Nolan's a master filmmaker. The acting is tremendous. The visual effects are extraordinary. The movie is three hours compelling, gives lots and lots of information, is deficient in certain ways, but the anti-nuclear message resonates throughout, and you can't miss it. Uh, I, w I wish that, that people had more knowledge going in because there's so many characters in the communist period, during the Manhattan Project, during the McCarthy period, so many scientists introduced, uh, and I think that most people are not going to be able to follow it. But it ends with the meeting between Oppenheimer and Einstein. That's shown several times. And, they, and, and Straws interprets this because then afterwards, Einstein walks past Straws and ignores him. And so Straws always interpreted this as they were talking about him. And it was another insult, another of Oppenheimer's insults against Straws. And this takes place when Straws is the head of the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton and is trying to bring Oppenheimer in as director. But the last scene in the movie ends with that discussion. And, uh, and, when, uh, and it goes back to their earlier discussion about the possibility of blowing up the world. And what they agree is that even though they didn't blow up the world during the Trinity test, they may have blown up the world anyway with developing the atomic bomb. So they understand. And we're, we're living in that world. That's the world that we're living in. And that's the world that Nolan is focused on. So really, in Nolan's mind, it's a movie for 2023. And he's got a comment. I wish I, well, let me find it here for you. He says in one of his interviews, he says um, that he told his, his teenage son, asked him what they're working, what he's working on. And he told him about the Oppenheimer movie. He's, and the teenage son says, well, nobody really worries about nuclear weapons anymore. Are people going to be interested in that? You know, and that's the problem. And that's what Nola was grappling with trying to convey the sense of urgency in a world in which if they thought the chances of nuclear annihilation were three in a million, the chances today are many times as great. And we're not, you know, and the Ukraine war is the immediate trigger. The likely Taiwan war is even probably in many ways potentially even more dangerous. We had General Minihan, Army General, say recently, that war between the United States and China is likely within two years. You know, and there are a lot of people who are thinking that and want to get this Ukraine war out of the way so they can focus on the real enemy, which in many of their minds in the Biden administration is China. And so I give Nolan a lot of credit. This movie is really passionately anti-nuclear, educational. I wish it were, I wish I could have had a, my hand in the script and I could have just added a couple more minutes and done a, done a few things that would have made it even clearer, more powerful. But I think that it's a remarkable achievement. And the fact that it was based on Marty and Kai's great biography, which I have around here somewhere, um, uh, American Prometheus, you know, a, a brilliant book, deserve, won and deserved to win the Pulitzer Prize back in 2005. I'm so sad that Marty passed away recently because he and Kai together would have been able to make a lot of these points. And Kai has gotten a lot of attention, but they don't ask him the right questions. Well, he will, well I will, because Kai, Kai's agreed to be interviewed sometime early in August, so we'll have him on. And back in 2020, Marty, Kai, Gar Alberts, and I did a series of international webinars, international press briefings, on the 75th anniversary of the atomic bombings, and the, all four of us drove these points home 
over and over and over again. And I wish Marty's voice were still here to help us drive it home again. And Dan Ellsberg, but I hopefully you'll you'll hear Dan in our in our film. We've got hours of Dan, so you'll be able to hear Ellsberg on all this. Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Please don't forget to hit the donate button. Uh, that's how we are able to keep doing this.